Make, this makes us, this discussion very uh, like a family like. Um, my name is Janusz Karpinsch. I am Assistant Director General of UNESCO and I will try to moderate this, this discussion. It uh, seems that uh, we have a big competitor, uh, the workshop on surveillance. It is in everybody's mind. Uh, what I will say uh, is that we will certainly read the transcript of that session. Uh, that's the good advantage of the uh, transcripts of, of all formal sessions here at um, IGF. Uh, we will be talking today about Internet universality concept of um, uh, UNESCO. It is not about Internet universality per se, but about concept that UNESCO um, has developed uh, for, the, for the purpose of um, uh, use with the member states and uh, uh, for the purpose of uh, 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 not going into explanation what we mean by Internet or what Internet we're talking about when we're addressing questions of Internet at UNESCO. Uh, we will start with the um, presentation of uh, of the report that will be done by Mr. Guy Berger, who is the Director of Freedom Expression and Media Development Division at UNESCO. And then uh, we will have um, uh, pan panelists uh, who will uh, speak about uh, their uh, sort of uh, opinion about the concept uh, itself and uh, uh, I ask them not to be kind, but to say what they really think, uh, because concept as it is uh, today has not pr been presented yet to member states, and we're still in the process of fine-tuning that, that concept before presentation. So, uh, without further delay, I will uh, ask uh, Guy Berger to introduce the concept. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, Internet universality, it may sound like a universal access, but it's a much bigger concept. And uh, much as universal access is an ambitious thing, this, uh, this concept is probably even more ambitious. So uh, to jump right in, this is the, 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 the concept. And uh, it's the concept that refers to the principles that underpin the kind of values and behaviors that shape the Internet. And uh, we've made it easy to understand the ROAM. So uh, we know that Rome was not built in a day. This is a different kind mm. of Rome. But anyway, <laughs> it's very easy to see from this. So it's uh, four interlocking principles that the Internet uh, is, is and should be rights-based, based on open technology and opportunities. In the bottom left, accessible to all. Bottom right, multi-stakeholders engaged. So I'll explain a bit more about those four uh, as, as I uh, continue. But as you can see, it's really not... Uh, Rocket science is really not difficult to, to understand. But for us, this is what has built the Internet up to its current uh, level of universality, and these are the principles that need to be respected if we want to see it uh, becoming even more universal. So uh, the reason for coming up with this concept is that we, we, we noticed that several uh, other organizations are developing concepts coming from different perspectives. Some say the free Internet, others say the open Internet, and uh, some were stressing access, and we thought, well, where would we come from from UNESCO in terms of a, a perspective here? The access, and we thought, well, where would we come from from UNESCO in terms of a, a perspective here? I'm getting a bit the of access, it. and we thought, well, where would we come <laughs> from from UNESCO in terms of a, a perspective? <laughs> the ghost in the machine. <laughs> so, uh, uh, UNESCO has had quite a few positions adopted by its member states, but. Uh, um, They've been sort of on particular aspects, such as multilingualism, such as ethics, and so on. And we thought it was time to really try and uh, take an overview, something that we could consolidate a position on in UNESCO. And particularly where I work, which is the freedom of expressions uh, uh, and media development, we need to say, well, how are we going to deal with uh, Internet uh, issues? I mean, what's, where, where do we fit in? Um, as we started to develop our thinking, partially in help from uh, Constant Bommela of Open uh, Internet Society, um, we started to also see the relevance of getting a, a kind of an identity for the rest of UNESCO as well. 
And UNESCO has this concept accepted by all its member states of the knowledge societies, which is a kind of more advanced form of information society. And we started to, to think that if you want to see the internet contributing to knowledge societies, you need a concept. And the concept would actually say th that uh, internet universality is the means towards knowledge societies. Um, we thought it could also provide a framework for internal synergies because at UNESCO you have people in education dealing with mobiles in education, ICTs in education, you have digital preservation, um, you have social science, science, and so on. So all these people are dealing with the internet in different ways. And we thought, m well, maybe we could actually work closer together in instead of all the silos. And ultimately, we wanted also to have an identity. If we came to places like this, people would say, oh, UNESCO, okay, they're the people with <laughs> the uh, internet universality concept. Maybe this could be a broader use as well. This, this, this concept, but of course, you know, that, that remains to be seen. So, to go ahead, what and why, uh, just to give you a bit of context here. So, UNESCO is now 195 st states. It's part of the UN, and so it's supposed to be, you know, universal. And if, you know, some member states were not members, it wouldn't be universal. But that's also why we thought it's appropriate that we could also try and promote a concept of universality. And not that the internet... Uh, uh, stops in this concept the internet is, 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 is many, many things. But in terms of what UNESCO does, it covers a range of human issues from education, culture, science, freedom of expression. So it covers quite a range of issues. And so we thought, well, this is appropriate that we should, as a universal organization, try and say, if you want universality in the areas we work, this is what's important. As I've uh, just mentioned, so there, there are these different areas that UNESCO uh, specializes in. And one of the things we're supposed to be is a laboratory of ideas. So hence, <laughs> we concocted this, 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 this concept. After a lot of uh, internal consultation and presentations at about 12 international events, and this is now one of the, the highlights, I think, with the team that we have here to, to give us feedback. The significance of this concept is related to UNESCO. So UNESCO is quite interesting because we have a headquarters in Paris, but we have presences in every country with a national commission, which is kind of an interface between UNESCO and civil society, between governments, uh, academics, media, geeks, wh whoever. So these national commissions are actually quite an important uh, interface between the intergovernmental system and the rest of society. And we have field offices in many countries. We have uh, various affiliated organizations. And I think UNESCO, uh, I don't want to blow the, the trumpet too much, but uh, we do play quite an influential role within the UN. Uh, on the plan of action on the safety of journalists. This year we are coordinators of the uh, UN Group on the Information Society, which is, I think, about uh, 15 different UN organizations, ITU and so on. And uh, earlier this year we kicked off the first big international review of the World Summit Information Society, which, of course, is going to be uh, culminate in 2015. Anyway, well, in, in developing this concept, we began to realize that people have different understandings of the internet. Some people see it as a vehicle for um, developing democratization. Other people see it as a vehicle for espionage. Other people see it as a way to flirt. And other people see it as a way to make money. And so there's lots and lots of different ways in which people approach the internet. And, and that's all fine. But uh, what for us is important is to begin to understand this is like the metaphor of the blindfolded people feeling the elephant. And so, you know, one feels the one leg and says this is a tree, and the other one feels another leg and says this is a pole, and the third one feels the trunk and says this is a hose pipe. <laughs> and none of them realize actually it's, a, it's one animal that they are talking about. And the important thing about this metaphor is that if you don't have um, all four legs on the elephant, that elephant isn't going to be able to move very fast. <laughs> so. Uh, to re just re refresh you, there are these four principles, uh, rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholderism. And I want to just now give a little bit of detail on that so that you've got um, some more sense of the, of the substance of this. So rights, when people talk about the free internet, you know, it, it's a nice uh, rhetoric. Nobody would uh, necessarily disagree with it. But what does it mean? So we thought if you say free to have use rights and have your rights respected, that's a way to get content to rights. Of course, there are lots of rights, and so the whole issue then becomes of balancing rights. But keep in mind, and I'll speak about this later, this is just one quarter of the, of the totality. Um, it's not the, the whole thing. 
Uh, we, we had a tweet yesterday. Somebody said, Internet freedom is freedom of expression online. Well, personally, uh, personally I like that, but actually there are other rights as well. So you have to look at that con conglomeration of rights. Openness, this here, of course, uh, as everybody would understand, it's open uh, uh, technology. Uh, you know, that's the, the whole basis on which the Internet has been built as a, a platform of HTTP, but also we want to extend that to saying open opportunities. So in other words, if there's uh, monopolies on ISPs or if there's monopolies that uh, block the rise of new players, that's not really an open system. And of course, a, uh, internet neutrality would be considered under this uh, principle of openness. Um, accessibility, well, of course, there's physical access, there's financial access and so on. But we also wanted to emphasize social inclusion. This is a big thing at UNESCO, inclusion of marginalized groups, uh, the participation of women on the Internet, to what extent um, it's a, it's a, it's a women-friendly space, etc. And MIL is media and information literacy because um, it's one thing to have access and another thing to actually be able to be literate in how to um, understand and use the Internet. And MIL, even a bit more broadly, is to, that you're dealing with a big animal, not just one uh, dimension. And finally, participatory in every way. Uh, you know, the internet has become what it is because so many people participate. And I don't only mean governance, but of course governance is very critical. There are, um, yeah, every user of the internet is participating in some in one way or another. And perhaps uh, this is a bit of a, a ripper from Abraham Lincoln, but you know, it's basically how do you have the internet for by and everybody? <laughs> well, uh, universality is the thing. So this is the proposal here, and we understand that other groups might want to put particular emphasis on free. Other groups might approach from openness because that's where, you know that's the entry into the whole thing. Uh, no problem at all. It's just that we should understand this is a, a complex totality. So there it is again, just to remind you, R O A M. Okay, and then I'll just uh, present my last uh, observation. Is as you can see, this is a jigsaw puzzle, and these things are interdependent. So. These are some of the interdependencies. Um, if you have the right uh, leg or the right principle respected, but you don't have access, it's obviously very limited. Okay, so that's why it's so important to have the accessibility as part of the, the puzzle. Um, when you're balancing rights, such as what is the right to uh, privacy versus the right to security, um, can this only be done by governments or should this be done with reference to the, to the fourth quadrant, which is multi-stakeholders have an interest, particularly multi-stakeholders to the private sector who <laughs> are sort of in the middle of this, this, this particular equation. So this is an important thing and it would be important uh, for us as UNESCO to remind uh, our, our member states, hey, in this debate, which in fact they're having, uh, and uh, it, it will be a big debate next month in particular, we need to say, in addition to the debate within UNESCO by all the diplomats, we need some forums where we can engage with multi-stakeholders as well. Uh, access without rights, of course, uh, it's very nice if everybody has access, but if the internet to which they have access is, is, is not respecting the right to freedom of information, the right to freedom of expression, it's a, it's a less uh, rich access, it's not universal. If you have walled gardens or national intranets, or if you have monopolies, of course, that's uh, by definition far from universality. If you have openness, well, you couldn't imagine openness without having multi-stakeholderism unimaginable. So those two go together, but they're not exactly identical. Openness, of course, is fundamental to the access question. Um, the reason why so many people have access is precisely because of the openness. Open source, as we know, supports privacy rights because it means that uh, you know, the possibility of having uh, backdoors in software is much less if it's uh, open, open source because there are more eyes inspecting it and so on. So you can begin to see how these different uh, four legs of the elephant are all important. And the multi taker governance underpins this all. So uh, that's uh, really this, the summary of this presentation. Um, we think there's a concept that could work for freedom of expression. Uh, in some ways, we would like freedom of expression to be the middle of the elephant, or to be the eyes of the elephant, <laughs> or the ears of the elephant, or the trunk of the elephant. But uh, leave that aside. Um, the point is we have to actually acknowledge on the internet, uh, freedom of expression is not the be-all uh, be all and end-all. It, it is really important, but it's one of many rights, and there are all these three other considerations as well. We think this can work for the f whole of UNESCO. We think it could maybe work for other stakeholders. Um, we think it's holistic and it's got rich potential to explore these things and leverage the interconnections. It's 
kind of descriptive, but it's also prescriptive. It's partially a normative concept to say, you know, if you want the Internet to be increasingly universalized, we've got to reinforce and strengthen those principles. Uh, the post-2015 development agenda with the, when the MDGs get replaced, we think this could really help people understand how the Internet can contribute to the new MDGs. It's a draft concept at the moment. We've been consulting with uh, stakeholders like who, who are here. We've had some one-to-one -one discussions with some member states, but we have not yet matured the concept enough to come to the member states and say, here, we're the laboratory of ideas. Do you like this concept? Do you want to, us to, to do further work on it? Uh, do you want to adopt this as a UNESCO brand, uh, as UNESCO's approach on, uh, to the Internet? Not that it's exclusive to UNESCO. So that will happen in the next six months, uh, unless, of course, people think the concept is such rubbish <laughs> at this thing that we can say, okay, back to the drawing board. Thank you, Yannick. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, now I will turn to panelists, uh, and uh, I will start with the one question to all of you. And the question is very simple. Are you convinced? If you, if you are, please say. If you are not, please say uh, what, what are elements in your view are missing. And let, let me start uh, with the Matthias, Matthias um, Kramer, uh, who is Austrian representative to Steering Committee of Media and Communication of the Council of Europe. And uh, uh, so the, we will have uh, also representatives from other stakeholder groups. But Matthias, please go first. Okay, good morning to everybody. Um, coming back to your direct question, convinced or not convinced, partly convinced. Um, first of all, of course, I have to say yes, uh, both for me as a representative of the national government in, in the center of Europe, but also as a civil servant working the context of Council of Europe and European Union a lot on Internet um, governance. Uh, we fully um, support and endorse what UNESCO has been doing in the context of the, let's see, universality of the Internet, of the concept of a free Internet on the works. And we absolutely think, and it is both my national and my European view, that UNESCO is the dedicated and right uh, organization and will get support. Um, when you ask me if I think that this concept of universality as it was just proposed meets our, let's say, um, our views, I can say, well, sometimes yes, but sometimes I say well, you didn't reinvent the wheel, and I think you didn't intend to do so. In principle, you can find everything like that, what the Council of Europe has already done so far in this holistic approach because there is an internet governance strategy of the Council of Europe. Uh, we are working in 40 lines uh, from 2012 till 2015. Um, there is a recommendation of the Committee of Ministers on the protection and promotion of the universality, integrity and openness of the internet. And when I compare it now, this concept with that what we have in the Council of Europe, Apart from the, of course, the one is a regional uh, organization, you are really working on the global, but I will come back to this. Um, maybe the main difference, and I mean it was explained by guys, that um, until now we see the concept, but this is a question of terminology, of course, we see the concept of universality as just as one of the principles. Um, and um, maybe from the Council of Europe's of view, the, the quest, uh, point of view, the question is, is there really one um, terminology appropriate to cover everything? Uh, for the Council of Europe, of course, it's the rule of law, it's, it's the human rights base, but I mean, I know it's the same for UNESCO. If the intention is, and I think that's what we should talk about, and I, I would have a lot of things to tell you, but I think after this presentation, we should really have a critical discussion about that. I think the intention you try to do, and that's quite the same what we actually try to do, do people outside our meetings and our dedicated delegates that are meeting here really understand what we do? Um, aren't we a closed kind of circle? Aren't 
to be honest, there are a lot of so-called conference tourists meeting every year, telling each other the same 500 or 5,000 words. Everybody's nodding because he feels to himself, yes, I have understood, I know that, I'm part of the community. The real challenge, and UNESCO as the organization uh, dedicated to education, the real challenge is not only to politicians, but especially to the public, to the citizens, and to people who have never had contact with the Internet so far, that to, to make it understand what is the benefit of that, what we all do here. Council of Europe, and that's my last point for my first intervention, is actually working much on this understanding what uh, the benefit of international work on the Internet is. We are working and it will be published in early 2014 on a real tool, on an instrument that can be used, uh, our wishes could be used globally, also by UNESCO. It's a compendium of Internet users' rights, human rights, especially to make it in an understandable language um, what, how are your human rights affected when you uh, press the button and you are online. And I think it's much about understanding. In principle, from a personal view, I think, why not call it it's the universal Internet? But we should not forget really to explain it then to people. What does it mean? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Matthias, um, for, for these comments. I, I, I believe that guys uh, are gearing up to respond, but not, not each intervention. Uh, but uh, I'll, I will collect you, and uh, I will go now to, to, to Karen, Karen uh, Mulberry from Internet Society. Thank you very much. I think that the approach that the Internet Society has taken and what we believe in um, is very compatible with, the, with what you have developed as your core principles here, because we too have um, a core fundamental principle of openness. You know, it, it is open and global standards for, for innovation. It's open communication for everyone. It's open for economic progress through that innovation. And it's the open multi-stakeholder governance for inclusion. So I think that the fundamentals that we have devised for how we view the Internet and how it should, should uh, interoperate globally fits very nicely with the principles that, that you have laid out. I mean, I don't think we've gone as far as saying that, that it is a human right, but we believe it is a right. Free flow of information is a right, and everyone should have the advantage to, to um, ex experience that without any kind of restriction or um, um, hurdles that they must go over to avail themselves of that information. Much like the, the open and global standards, the, you know, the community collaboration that happens, it's very critical for contributing not only for the innovation in one segment, but for all segments of the world. Because if we can't collaborate and we use the Internet as that tool, um, we, we have really limited ourselves. And, we, and, and frankly, you know, the, the person in, that might be on a, in an obscure place on the globe might have the one thing to contribute that changes everything. And if you don't allow that, that accessibility and the ability to then contribute to the whole, you've limited an opportunity for, for the world. So I think that what we believe and fundamentally ties very nicely to what you've laid out as your core principles. Uh, thank, thank you, Karen. Uh, in, indeed, we don't know what's coming, uh, coming next. And uh, from, from, one, from one side, that, that is very exciting, but from the other side, that sometimes it's a bit scary. <laughs> but let's, let's stay on the positive side. Now, uh, next I will, I will turn to two uh, representatives of uh, civil society. I, I, uh, I will start with Andriet Esterhosen, uh, CEO of Association for Progressive Communications from South Africa. Thank you, Janus, and apologies to everyone for being late. Um, I think the answer is um, yes and not yet in terms of whether I'm convinced. 
I, I am convinced that we need something. I think that the, 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 the Internet is such a contested space, and it's such a, Internet governance is such a contested space, and that's not going to go away because we have businesses doing business, and we have business models that then intersect with, 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 with government surveillance um, tactics, and yet those same business models also enhance user experience in a particular way. So they are real and create industry um, which, which, which can enable expression of some rights while also violating other rights. So there's a lot of contestation. And I think we're still just you know, scratching the surface. What happens when we start talking about taxation in a big way, except in relation to one or two companies? or VAT, uh, you know, Amazon, the latest trend is that Amazon has to charge VAT, but that's a relatively simple solution. So I think we need something. I mean, ideally, I and APC have felt that something that is more grounded in legal frameworks and, and international law and international human rights mechanisms would be a, a sounder, more effective normative uh, um, platform. So, for example, recognition of the Internet as a global public good or as a common pool, pool good. So these are concepts that have some legal grounding and that can then give guidelines to the development of legislation at, at international and national level. So that's kind of my dream. I'm not convinced that that will necessarily work. And therefore, I think coming up with principles which are normative uh, to some extent, um, but that create a common platform for, con for, for negotiating the contestation. I think it, it is a useful thing. Because um, I think the issue here is that we all say we uh, govern the Internet and think it should be governed in a public interested way, but we define the public interest in very different ways, and I think that's acceptable. But we, if we have common values and principles that allow us to contest whether your public interest is more public than my public interest, I think it can promote the multi-stakeholder engagement and facilitate it. So, um, and I think an example is the Brazilian CGI.br, um, their, their principles, which were fantastic. Everyone agrees on them. But now that they are negotiating legislation, uh, the, the Marco Civil, you do have the telcos coming in and contesting the net neutrality principle, for example. So I think, yes, but I think that Maybe what I feel about the UNESCO principle is that it is, maybe as Matthias was saying, I think it's, it's, I like it, I identify with it. I do think it's restating a lot of the, the very generic human rights oriented principles that exist already. Um, I think we need something a little bit more. I think the Brazilian suggestion that we might in April or May talk about an international civil framework is a, is a brave and interesting one and, and I think it's worth doing. So yes, the idea is good, but I think we're going to need to go a little bit further than that um, for it to work, but also not too far, because if we go too far, then we will lose a platform that, that where there's the willingness of all these different interest groups, groups to come together, because business could just opt out, for example, and I don't think we want that. In interesting. And I'm just, just thinking, uh, should, should we to Rome add also uh, ING to have a roaming? <laughs> uh, now I'm turning to, to Parminder to, uh, from, from uh, uh, Internet Governance uh, Caucus from India. Yeah, that's uh, an early identity. I'm with IT for Change as an NGO. <coughs> I was at one time a co-coordinator of Internet Governance Forum, but that gets changed every two years. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. That's uh, very fine. I value that identity very much. Uh, uh, see, uh, the question is, one, are we convinced? I think, do we agree would be a little better to go, a better pace to go. Uh, I think I agree, first of all, that we need a new concept to claim this social artifact which has become something very different than even f what it was five years back and then of course 10 years back and 15. It is no longer just a technology platform where people can communicate but it's affecting almost every social sector and it has to be therefore identified 
with a particular meaning, it has to be infested in a particular meaning, uh, so we need a concept. I agree that. I agree UNESCO is the right agency to re lead that. It has been the kind of the moral side of uh, global governance consciousness for a long time. Its areas of mandates of work are about education, science, cultural diversity, ethics, uh, which is the way we claim this uh, space back for the people, not that, okay, I could come whether it's gone away from the people or not. And, and for a concept, universality looks good. Uh, and we need, uh, we need to have kind of slogans, you know, you would have to have a big program behind it, of course, and slogan wouldn't su be sufficient, but yes, slogans, uh, clearly understandable uh, concepts uh, matter. Very quickly, uh, the issues are that the internet was made as an open platform among academicians, engineers, and was born in one of the best places it could be born in the U.S. academic institutes, which had a great, uh, uh, great uh, tradition of openness and academic uh, equity among all people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which values got imbibed into it, and that's what is still a lot of internet. However, at one stage, it was also claimed under a certain policy framework, which was the Clinton era framework of global e-commerce which defined it primarily as a marketplace uh, and whereby there is certain disbalance of it being as a marketplace vis-a-vis -vis it being a platform for democracy, for knowledge sharing and many other things which it could be. Uh, and since then I think the policies and the outlook which kind of comes to people's mind when they see internet and policy spaces is still commercial space and, and to, to kind of claim it as people's internet, a platform share of sharing of knowledge um, and uh, for democratic participation, I think uh, these kind of concepts are important. So this is the agreement and this agreement is in the way probably we need to kind of present the concept of universality. Just two quick points and then we can perhaps come back. When I hear this word universality, two things come to my mind. One is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and universal as in value. And then I hear this word universal in social policy a lot. Universal education, universal access, and universal is then a need. So universal is a value and universal is a need. And it's largely uh, a social policy element, also has a strong redistributive element. Everybody needs to be provided with certain things. So there should be greater balance on the social and economic rights, which are traditionally ones actually a lot of them, freedom of expression, but also education, cultural diversity, which is UNESCO's mandate. So I think uh, evolution of this concept is needed, but I agree with the broad directions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Parminder. And uh, now let's uh, turn to uh, industry. We have uh, uh, Patrick Ryan from Google and then uh, Michael Nelson from Microsoft. Patrick, please go first. Thank you, Yanis, and yeah, if you could pull up my, my slide here for a second. I uh, think this is a really important conversation. It's a really good one that you guys are having. It's the second opportunity I've had to uh, to discuss this. We had a, a, a forum, or I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it Shangwei? Shangwei? Sien Ho. Sien Ho presented the, uh, she actually presented a picture of the elephant, right? And I'm a little disappointed that you don't have that picture of the elephant up there. Um, not because I think that you should use the elephant in your work, uh, it's actually a very complicated thing because when you start talking about you know, what goes in the trunk and what goes in the foot, it turns out a lot of things ended up in the, in the back part of the elephant, right? <laughs> and that was, uh, that was not a very, um, I felt like that was not a very productive you know, part of the conversation, although the concept is really good um, and you have really brought out the elephant in the room. Um, and so this is a really hard thing to do when you're, when you're trying to be a thought leader and experimenting in these things as an organization, you know, to come up with these types of phrases and to describe them. And, uh, you know, while I'm making light of it, I think overall it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, constructive effort and you should really be commended for showing leadership in this because it's extremely difficult. I don't think you'll ever get consensus around 195 nations. And uh, so do I think this is right? I think partially yes and partially no. Um, and that's probably about as good as you're ever going to get. And so I would, uh, you know, I, I think that's for, for that reason it's worth, uh, you know, certainly worth moving forward with. Um, what, what I wanted to talk about with this little, uh, with this little uh, diagram uh, is 
related to this because it, it has to do with a proposal. Um, and this really isn't an official Google proposal, but it's something that, that Vint Cerf and Max Sengus and I have, uh, have put together in, in, a, in a thought piece that we're, that, we're, um, that we're publishing shortly. There's a draft available if you're interested. Because we've been asked the question and, and have been trying to sort of answer it internally and externally as to how these different organizations fit in yeah. to the Internet governance world. It's just not obvious. And so one of the, the, the ways that we decided to try to take a look at it is to look at what um, uh, one version of the of what you know the layered system in the internet. At the bottom, you have the infrastructure layer where you know the pipes that really that really make things work. The logical layer with the technical standards that, that exchange information. The content layer, the you know the the things that people like to read and use on the internet and discuss about it. And then we added this new social layer, which includes concept of trust and that sort of thing. Um, and it's important for us to, to try to categorize these things because in the past year, when, we're, when we had this huge debate around Internet governance focused on the role of the ITU, you know, there was a perception that uh, you know, Google hates the ITU, right? And we don't want the ITU to do anything. And you know, there's a lot of anger around what the ITU does. And yet, that's just not correct. That's not our view. And if you really sit down and talk to to, uh, to a lot of people that, that do this work, nobody really thinks that the, the ITU is, is doing anything wrong. It's a 150-year-old organization and has been very effective in the infrastructure layer, but that observation has not been clear. What made us very nervous is the work that the ITU, for example, was doing up at the top of the stack in the content layer where it does not have the experience and expertise. It does a wonderful job of making sure that the broadband is down at that infrastructure layer and growing. Now, looking at this from UNESCO, perspective, um, we also um, you know, wanted to try to present internally how we think UNESCO plays in the Internet governance world. And this is where we think it is, up in the top of the stack, working on these very hard thought questions. Um, and it's, it's, just a, it's, you know, it's just a proposal in terms of, this doesn't have all the organizations here, but it's just a proposal in terms of how to think about some of these things and how to focus some, uh, some, some energies. Um, in terms of uh, turning to now to this particular topic of universal universality, um, there's some interesting. Uh, you know, I've talked about this internally about what this means to to, to my colleagues, and and people scratch their head. They're like, what? <laughs> what is this internet universality, and why is UNESCO getting into universal service? Right? Universal service is a concept that, that's really access based and deals with getting, you know. Uh, getting the pipes out to the, you know, out to the, uh, to, to, to the edges, right? And, um, and, and of course, this has nothing to do with universal service, not even in the slightest. But, uh, but you know, the use of language sometimes, sometimes leads that to the conclusion. And now you've got Rome, which is like, you know, which, as you mentioned, roaming. Here we're using some telecom terms. I don't think you can solve all of these problems. I mean, the Internet is faced with it. How many conversations have we all been in where we talk about IP systems, and you have two people talking about IP systems, and it's not until 20 minutes in <laughs> you realize that one is talking about intellectual property, you know, they're talking about Internet protocol, right? So I don't have a solution for that, but um, I think that uh, I think that this is a really good, uh, I think it's something to sort of acknowledge is one of the challenges. To, um, now, finally, to, to Henriette's point, I, I think that this is, um, that this, is, that this is really good, that this could form the, the basis for something, but that it could be and should be bolder. Um, that may be hard for an organization like UNESCO that has to satisfy so many constituents, but I think that's going to have to be the, the, the role that UNESCO tries to play because uh, there aren't that many global organizations in this space that are really trying to do that. In the context of the Brazil discussion that's been so hot this week, uh, we've heard that they've been, you know, potentially talking about using a, um, a version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and sort of modify it for the Internet. If that's true, this is where UNESCO needs to be. Now, there's no competition. It's not like any organization needs to dominate or monopolize that conversation. The, the Council of Europe, you know, do, does its work and everybody else does its work, but it shouldn't be viewed as a competition. It, it really, it, it may... It, but maybe, maybe let me say it, 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 it is a competition, but that's okay. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Hmm? No, no, just, just, yeah. I have no pouvoir, but I say it as an Austrian civil servant. It's terrible competition. Just when you look at the European level, 
EU and Council of Europe, it's a terrible competition. It's a question of the t external competences of EU. But as far as member states work, for example, in an international organization, it's absolutely critical towards the EU representation. They will say, well, that's none of your business. That's EU competition. <laughs> and you're so right, and both for member states and for industry, that's really getting more and more problem. Thank you. My microphone, so that was Matthias who was speaking, is just for the sake of the record. So please, uh, Patrick, continue. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really just about to wrap up. I do think that we need that this is going to be one of the big challenges that we're going to face head on over the course of the next year, is how do we deal with all of these competing interests and values, uh, organizations that are otherwise aligned in terms of what you want to accomplish, but have your own programs, right? And come together in a meaningful way that advances the interests of the, of the, uh, you know, of, of, that all of us have in order to, you know, maintain a, a, much, a much more secure, safer, trusted internet. Um, uh, I think uh, I think it's going to be important to, to at this point to, to take what you've done. Um, this is fine, and now you know let's let's put it up and then start working on implementation and start getting bolder, and start integrating this with some of the other, some of the other initiatives. So thank, thank you, Patrick. I, I think the whole uh, history of, uh, or modern history of humanity has shown that it is uh, very easy, no, very easy, it, it is much, much easier to agree on principles rather than implement those principles in a coherent manner. <laughs> so that is, that is what we see also with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and implementation of principles enshrined in the uh, Universal Declaration in the practical life in different countries. Now that is a different uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Michael, what do you will say? Well, I want to start by saying how grateful I am to be here. Uh, I've been thinking about these issues for a very long time. As a matter of fact, UNESCO helped get me to think about these issues back in 1995. Uh, even though uh, the U.S. government was not involved in UNESCO at that point, I was at the White House working on digital issues and was invited to give a keynote speech at a UNESCO conference on infoethics, the societal, legal, and ethical implications of the information highway in Monaco. A three-day conference, and I learned so much about what was going on and how people were thinking about this, but I have to say, Almost 20 years ago, when I went to that meeting, the discussion was very confused. Uh, we've come a long way. Uh, and I've come a long way from being a White House aide to working for IBM, working at Georgetown University, and now working for Microsoft. Um, I should also say I've been very involved in the Internet Society since throughout that time. And I have to have a disclaimer. I am not speaking for any of those organizations today. I may not even be speaking for myself. <laughs> because part of this discussion, I think, I'm going to take off my Microsoft hat and put on a devil's advocate hat, and I'm going to try to give you some feedback that you might get from other people who aren't in this conversation, people I work with every day, engineers, marketing people, CFOs, and my own students. Because I think this is a very good document. It's getting a very good discussion going, but it's not what you really want if you want to position UNESCO as the center of the debate for everybody. And so uh, let me start by giving you the grade. I'm a professor of Internet Studies at Georgetown. This paper is a B plus. <laughs> and I'm a very hard student, hard, very hard grader. It can be an A plus. And I think you've heard some very good comments already. Usually I hate being the last person on a panel, but half of my comments have already been made, so uh, this is great. Um, but let's, be, let's, let's pick up where Patrick left off. Let's think about making this bolder. And let's start by thinking about talking about more than the Internet. One of the things that I was troubled by in the, in the document is that you sweep in a lot of things that many of us would not see as being the Internet. And if I could retitle this, I would call it Universal Digital Rights, colon, the any cloud for everyone. 
let me describe the any cloud. The any cloud is enabling anybody to connect to anything, anywhere, anytime. <laughs> Should we attribute that and mention who said that? <laughs> the NSA already knows. Um, no, no, that was, not, that was not in the microphone. That's not on the record. <laughs> but the, the any cloud consists of the Internet at the bottom, all the cloud data centers that um, Google and Amazon and Microsoft and IBM run, cloud then is connected to the cloud of things, all these billions of sensors we're going to connect. And it's all made accessible through new interface technologies, something that Microsoft spent a lot of time working on, making it easier for everybody to interact with the data. And those three things together, the internet, the cloud, the cloud of things, and these tools for interacting with it, make up an infrastructure that is fundamentally changing society. And it's very similar to what we did in the Clinton administration. I came into the White House in 1993. The commercial web was just being born. And we recognized that was a huge opportunity. So 20 years ago, we wrote the National Information Infrastructure Dash Agenda for Action. And it wasn't about the market. It was about democracy. It was about education. It was about better government. It was about everything. And it was a visionary document that we still can use today, 20 years later. We then wrote the national, the global information infrastructure that extended the vision worldwide. And then we wrote the third book in the trilogy, which was the Magaziner Report that you referred to. But that was just one piece of it. You could write a document similar to the national information infrastructure vision. And you could lay that out in a very effective way that would connect to a lot of people and motivate a lot of governments, motivate a lot of business people, academics, NGOs. But you have to be more crisp. You have to think bigger than just the Internet. And I think it would be very good if you, folk, you, you didn't just say that a rights-based approach was part of it, but instead you focused entirely on the rights. Um, when another document I, I helped write 10 years ago were the policy principles for the Internet Society. Uh, at the time, the Internet Society was not running the .org domain name. They didn't have budget. I was a volunteer. I was their vice president for policy and also working full-time at IBM. And we laid out six things that ISOC would fight for. I wanted to call them rights. But in the end, we decided that engineers talk about abilities. So we talked about abilities. The ability to connect, the ability to speak, the ability to innovate, the ability to choose, the ability to share, and the ability to trust. And that, again, was a very effective document that has guided ISOC as it's going forward. If I wrote it today, I would add a seventh one, the ability to team. But you need that kind of direct language in this document. Team. Oh, team, team, to collaborate. I don't like words like collaborate. They're too long. Team. <laughs> um, what's that? That's true. It, and it sounds different in different places. But there are lots of soccer fans out there. Um, so anyway, let's, let's get back to a couple other things about the document that I, I really like. And the main one is I, I really like open. Open standards and interoperability is key. I really like accessibility. We fought hard on that. And of course, we all love our favorite word, multi-stakeholder. So you've got a lot of the core here right. You just have to wrap it in a somewhat different package. You have to think bolder. You have to go a bit further. And I think it's going to be a, a, a great final document as you work through this. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I like, I like the situation when professor grades another professor. <laughs> So uh, now I will I will turn to Arkham Blanc from from uh, OECD, uh, our sort of uh, sister organization in the same at least neighbor organization rather sister organization in, in, in Paris, uh, working also a, a lot on internet uh, related issues. Um. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, that's an interesting presentation with a good panel, and that's an interesting initiative. Um, you want us to be the devil's advocate. I think it's, it's an excellent way of getting input and making people feel comfortable. So I think I agree with what seems to be um, the thread across the different interventions. Um, this is not enough. And maybe it's not sufficiently focused on the digital rights. I very much like this expression, the digital rights of, of um, the entire humanity. Um, there's a word which I didn't hear, which I think is, is really important, is diversity. You, you didn't take it as one important element. Maybe it's embedded in... Multi-stakeholder. Yeah, but diversity is not only about yeah. multi-stakeholder. Uh, you have multilingualism, you have different cultures, and this is really important. When we think of trying to not have one global internet which looks the same, just like the malls around the world, you know, you find the same brands everywhere, Vuitton, or, for example, and the French one. So you, you need to have the diversity in all its aspects. Um, and then I have a problem with the term universality. Why do, you want, why do you want to say it's universal? It, it, I don't know, I feel very uncomfortable with that. First of all, I think it's not enough to be universal. Second, it's not clear enough to be uni universal. So I would say that at this stage, it goes in the right direction, but focusing on rights, digital rights, focusing on um, the, the human, the essential aspects of you know, the human rights would be probably important. And then don't call it universal. If it is universal, if it is recognized as universal, it will be universal. Uh, we are not at the same, it, it's not n the moment, we are not 50 or more years ago when, when we had the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. So How about interplanetary? <laughs> yeah. No, inter intergalactic. I think <laughs> if, if we do, then we need to go. <laughs> well, Vince, Vince is working on the interplanetary yeah. inter protocol. No, I, th I think that that is done already. He told me that that's more or less done. Intergalaxy -gal hasn't been done yet. Yes, please. I was looking in the, in the public if there is anybody in, from the audience who wanted to join in with the comments. But please, please. Uh, just following on that. this, I think... Uh, that is Parminder talking. Parminder, uh, sorry, we should uh, uh, introduce ourselves for the sake of recording. Uh, Parminder from IT for Change. We seem to take certain concepts as given and known. We think we know rights, and I don't think we are talking about the same thing when we say rights. It should be rights-based. I mean, UNESCO knows for the last many, many decades what rights are. People in social movements in developing countries knows what are the rights. I mean, people talking about right to reproductive health. India has a bill now which provides right to food, and the rights are a very complex space. And to be uncomfortable with universalism, uh, I mean, I think the universalism brings the economic and social rights part of it, and universal declaration of human rights, uh, universal, as I said, as a part of social policy. These parts are basic to rights. I think equality, freedom, and solidarity was said before rights were, and they are, uh, universality is equality. Um, so, and for me, the biggest concern in this debate and most of the debates in internet governance and the IGF is, yeah, yeah let's talk rights. And I know what is being said in that rights, freedom of expression, and even UNESCO for many years complexified even freedom of expression as partly a positive right, the conditions of freedom of expression. So when we talk digital rights, it's a huge space of people's consciousness forming a political uh, claim. And that is, and that, that universality is a very basic, even perhaps a prior uh, thing. That's why there's a universal declaration of human rights which follows a series of uh, human rights. Yeah, no, uh, and that was first. And then, no, um, uh, and that was first, and then you. If Anne wants to ah. respond directly, that's fine. Ah. Well, I just Please want to clarify what I meant. If you call it universal, 
you, you fence it to a certain extent. You see what I mean? I, I take universal in two, with two meanings. I agree that we need to have universal digital rights, but at this stage, to me, it's not universal, these four concepts. So I, I just fear that if you call these universal, then it's going to be very hard to add to these four main elements. You see what I mean? It's a value. It's not a state. It's not a state of the Internet. It's not a state of the Internet. It's a value. When we say universal Internet universality is being articulated as a value, in the same way rights are a value, we can hardly say the rights are realized. So these are values. It's not a state. Yes, Parminda, but if I think that there are other values which are universal, which are not in the list of these four, it's going to be hard for me to fight for those. That's what I mean. Yeah, no, I, I, see, I see on your point. Uh, there is, there is uh, some, uh, certainly th there is a uh, value in what, what you're saying, but from other side, uh, UNESCO being universal organization, yeah, you see, there is a different interpretation of, of the same term, uh, universality. We need, we, if, if, we need, if we need to uh, change it, then we need to find the, uh, the word or term which would uh, also indicate the, uh, the global nature of uh, our sort of reach. Anyway, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not simple. Yes, I, I will give uh, Andrés and then, and then you may. Thanks, thanks, Janis. I actually share um, Anne's, um, well, we, oh, and we agree about everything except intellectual property. Um, <laughs> we said that. We don't share the same I'm joking. Now, I, I also share that concern about universality, but maybe that's because I spent so many years working in telecoms policy and regulation. So for me, it still is a concept that applies to access and one that has not being, you know, applied nearly as effectively as I would have liked it to be applied. Um, and, it, and, and, I, and I also, in fact, in, the, in some of the inter existing internet um, declarations of principles, it is there in relation to access. Um, and so I'm, and I'm quite comfortable with it in relation to access. I'm not necessarily comfortable with it in relation to a header for this statement or this set of principles or even norms that we are looking for. But then I really have just two, two questions um, for, our, for the panel, for ourselves. And that is the online and the offline. Sorry. I, I want to respond to your okay. question. Okay. Well, let, okay. If Giannis allows. I, th th I, this is getting way too agreeable because I just wanted to agree with you and, and Patrick that mm -hmm. universal isn't the right word here and partly because it's universal service. And what I would recommend instead is either global or more interesting, why don't we talk about interoperable digital rights? It's an engineering Bec term. Because it's an engineering term. And, 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 you know, I think if we're going to let anyone set our language, I'd rather have the lawyers do it, particularly the human rights lawyers. But, 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 but I, I, think it's, I think what your point is is an interesting one because it's a point of terminology. And I think if you do, and I hope some PhD student just does an analysis of all these different Council of Europe, um, Internet Society, APC, you know, and so on, IRP, and maybe you know, uh, OECD analysis from a terminology perspective. So but but interoperability also gets to your point about diversity and different groups doing different things yeah. but all working together. Yeah, but, sorry, but Lenny, so but let me just I don't my like interoperability. <laughs> it's not for the OECD, although we, you know, it's too engineer. Uh, and about basic, basic universal rights, the idea being to yeah. say that this is the core, maybe you, know, you define the core, but you could add to it. Basic might be also, better. interoperability is a very important I think principle in the internet, so I wouldn't diffuse it by using it in, in any context other than what it should apply to, which is inter interoperability between systems and platforms and, and protocols. So maybe it's no, one so of the principles that so let, Yes, I think it should definitely be there. So I think the two problems that I want to just ask about, the one is the online and offline. How do we uh, ensure that this, this, this set of, of this framework that we are after um, articulates, reinforces um, um, enforcement and mechanisms for rights informants in the offline world. So how do we prevent it from even suggesting that there's an alternative 
set of mechanisms that need to be developed. You know, and I'm saying that particularly because of, of some of the recent, very, I think, uh, significant achievements in human rights mechanisms, the interpretive statements on freedom of association and freedom of expression online actually has very detailed guidelines that can be used. So I think the existing human rights instruments are coming up with a more sophisticated approach to integrating offline human rights mechanisms and online. And I think that can be applied to other jurisdictional areas as well. And, and then so, so, so that's the first question. And then the second question is to you, Patrick, because I think for me the problem with that diagram, and it's, it's kind of where, where do you interface between how does market regulation and principles and policy interrelate in the internet world because that that diagram I think that that whole thing about the layer diagram is that we now have so many business models and business entities who actually operate on a vertical where they are they have they have in, in investments in 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 all or or you know or more than one of those. And, and the user experience is also often so in, in a vertical. So I think that for me means that, yes, the principles are fine, but do we also need to make sure that those principles can also guide market regulation? And how do we avoid market regulation in the way that the ITU sometimes might want to apply it, harming some of those principles? So, and how do we make sure the public interest is at the core of it all? So, um, Matthias asked for, for, for the floor, uh, Patrick, I see you also getting, getting free ride. Uh, we're discussing also your concepts now. But uh, let me, let me, <laughs> let me look, look at the uh, audience. Is there anybody who would like to say something in, in this debate? No, I don't, don't see. Uh, then Matthias, please, go ahead. Very briefly, um, I want to fully support what ATC says. I really like your intervention. I support it fully, and if I change my job, maybe one day I will join you. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding, but uh, I don't intend to do so, actually. But what I think what you pointed out very much is, um, and also you and I think most of the panelists here, um, we have really to focus on there's one common thing we all agree upon, in this, let's say, uh, panel at least, it's this human rights-based approach. And the human rights-based uh, approach, I would say, you can find already in the, in the Convention Human Rights, which has the big advantage that we also have a court there in the European, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, new one, as only court in acting in this, uh, let's say, international way, has meanwhile a case law also on the internet, uh, starting with jurisdiction, um, with, with positive obligations and so on. So I think this approach also of UNESCO must be a uh, human rights approach. I'm a little bit worried about the discussion here because it reminds me so much of discussions you have among diplomats, although there are no diplomats, I as far as I see here on the stage, it's a few ambassadors. <laughs> but um, diplomats like, and especially also in fora like this, like to love to discuss lengthy hours about titles, about idioms, and yep. for example, and procedures. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a little bit, uh, that's a bit the, the danger that we do here. Um, that, uh, for example, in, in Vienna, I am actually also preparing a conference for the Council of Europe on the Internet Governance Strategy. I got, I think, hundreds of mails from colleagues from other ministries about just the title and the name. People don't care about if it's called, sorry to say so, universality or what, whatever the pro and cons. What we have to explain to people is freedom is the rule, and if there is an intervention, that's the exception, it is based on the three principles. It's, it's, it has to be prescribed by law, it must be a proportionate, it must be a legitimate aim. But that's what we, that's what we talk about, and I don't see, uh, let's say, a big problem when you say you have diversity on the one hand, and um, you 
universality on the other hand, because I think you need the diversity, especially also the diversity of languages, the diversity of cultures, that people understand the Internet. And so, I mean, for me, diversity is one of the prerequisites to keep diversity that Internet can become, uh, let's say, a global or whatever universal um, instrument. Okay. Uh, Anne, please. May I respond? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not against the term universal. I think it's important that we have something universal. What I'm saying is that at this point in time, where there is a proposal, which is a good proposal, but everybody said it's not bold enough. I don't want it to be told universal yet. And just to, to defend uh, a little bit the, those diplomats and, and their administrations uh, who spent hours discussing uh, titles. Maybe the titles sometimes reflect something. What is perhaps more problematic is the procedure. But the only thing is you should discuss about a title just after you have discussed about the content. In, in, then we in shouldn't the have any title when it's a proposal. <laughs> but, some, but somehow we need to name it anyway. Uh, I think we would agree that we don't need a solution if we don't have a problem. If we don't have a problem identified, then we don't need the solution. And I think we have a problem. And if, I think we should discuss whether we have a problem. It's not that UNESCO wants to continue as an agency and work in this area. Therefore, they need to you know, put some slogan. I think that's not it. I think there's a problem. And if we, whether we agree on the problem or not would depend on whether we need slogans or not. And I think there are hegemonic discourses which go with certain slogans. Sometimes you have to reclaim things if you have to decide to reclaim things. If you think your things are not going completely in the wrong, right direction, you construct alternative discourses. And UNESCO's and all as global uh, holders of public interest are supposed to do. Two things. One, like openness is the main word used with the Internet today. And I think it has been useful and it has limitations. Now, if you make a room in some parts of Alaska while being very cold and far away and administered by the U.S. government and say everybody's welcome to come in and that's open, but that's not open because we know that just because you keep the doors open, it doesn't become open. And universal adds that you actually ensure that everybody reaches there. So openness is an existing concept. Universe, we think there is a limitation to that, and I think universalism adds to that, which is a positive thing that you ensure that everybody reaches there. Universality ensures openness just gives the conditions. We actually wrote a paper uh, recently for a forthcoming MIT publication in which we discussed openness versus public and how openness is a negative rights thing and public is positive rights things. We said a clearing in a forest may be open, it's not public, because it doesn't have conditions of security in which you can actually stand and do things which you want to do in a public park. So they, these, these different conditions, and I think if we don't have a problem, if we think everything is fine as things are going, we don't need to invent new slogans and new programs. I think there is a huge centralization of power. I, I think you guys know those statistics. Uh, ten years back, like, the top 10 websites in the U.S. had 33% page view. Five years back it was 50, and now it is 75% page view of just 10, net 10 web pages. And there's many other concentrations happening, and there are exclusions happening. And if we think there is a need of slightly adjusting the you know, discourse, I think UNESCO is the right one. And that's the only need of a new thing, which adds the economic rights and social rights definition. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Parminder. I, uh, yeah, now Patrick, and then I will ask uh, Guy to, to say, to defend himself. <laughs> thank uh, you. I'll, I'll, I'll try mean, to be def quick. Defend, I defend the, <laughs> the title. I'll, I'll address the question that you asked me separately, Henri, but I wanted to, this is a great opportunity for me to disagree with, with my colleague from Microsoft about his proposal for my cloud and tie it all in with this really interesting discussion around, around, around words. This is something that's been very important to me. Uh, the use of the word cloud has been extremely detrimental to the whole discussion. It's a marketing term that has been you know, invented a few years ago and it confuses people um, and, the, uh, and it, it applies throughout this space. I mean, if you, I got my PhD in Europe and I was just astonished at how many Europeans are specialists in developing these crazy acronyms and focused on these, on these words and uses and, and here we are talking about universality and 
Rome, and these are all really great concepts, but what's happening is it's detracting from the conversation. When we're talking about the internet, we're not, you know, how many conversations we had where it's like a cloud or it's like a freeway? You know what, in 2013, the, we're, we, we can talk about the internet as being the internet. The internet is the internet. We don't, need to, we don't need to call it anything special. We don't need to, you know, put any new words on it in order to help people that, that don't understand it anymore because it's the Internet and we know what it is. And when it comes to, um, when it comes to these, these, these discussions around, around universality in Rome, how, many, how much effort do we put on this? Why not just call the paper UNESCO's view on its work on the Internet? A really boring title, <laughs> right? But, but your... But you're, Topics in there won't get won't get buried in this insane discussion around whether universality is universal service or what we mean by that and that sort of thing. And you really be focusing on the concepts. So thank you, Patrick. Guy. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure if the baby's still alive or, <laughs> or not, but. Um, uh, clearly, one of the issues is uh, what words one uses uh, and not what, what it means. And, uh, and so many things are metaphors, as, as was mentioned. They all come with their own baggage. Uh, you know, the cloud, as you mentioned. Uh, when you're talking about openness and uh, open highway, you know, if you think of highways, well, some people can't go on highways because they don't have vehicles. And, you know, there's, there's, you, you know, all these things kind of come with baggage. Even when you say the internet is a network of networks, it sort of starts begging lots of questions, you know, <laughs> as to... Uh, what that really means. When you talk about uh, openness in the house in Alaska, I, um, I, I was thinking, wow, would I, would I want to be in a house in Alaska with the doors being open? Because, <laughs> and in fact, uh, it reminded me also of the uh, famous uh, statement by Gandhi that he said uh, he wants to live in a house uh, that has the windows open so that you know, fresh air comes in, but it shouldn't be so open that you, know, you get blown out the house. Uh, and I think that um, this relates to you. If you want the internet so, it's so open, no rights get respected, and there's no um, mechanism to, 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 to close the door when you know, there's, 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 there's a storm coming. So uh, anyway, this is all about playing with words, but it, it also comes back to, uh, uh, in particular, this Gandhi example, about because um, he was talking about the, this in the context of culture. He was saying, you know, you don't want to live in a house where culture you know, is, is so uh, insular it doesn't get aerated. I mean, you don't want to live in a place where your culture gets blown up. Right? So uh, diversity and uh, people did say in response to diversity cases and they said take hold. Diversity uh, also to the extent of multilingualism and culture is under rights under this concept. Uh, and definitely that's a big thing for UNESCO that you know, we're trying to promote cultural rights. As well as education rights and I mean, we're not in the business of security rights, but I mean, that, you, if you're looking at rights, you have to take into account all those rights and the question of, of the, the, the balance between them. Um, well, I, I think what became clear to me in this discussion is that, uh, in one hand, yes, we're stating the obvious with these um, four principles because, you know, I mean, you know they, they, they are motherhood and apple pie, but I think the, the value of putting them together is to say, you've got to see them as a package. You can't take the internet only with one. Uh, so if you are uh, um, a geek and you're interested in uh, interoperability, don't forget the right side of it. <laughs> if you are a government and you're concerned about security and, and privacy, and uh, you know, don't forget the multi-stakeholder side of it. So I think this is the value of this. And in stating the obvious in that way, I think it's also possible to make it uh, accessible <laughs> to ordinary people. The Rome thing, of course, it has some baggage if you know about telecoms and so on and so forth. But it's just really supposed to be a, a, an acronym a heuristic to say, okay, how do you remember these four things? You know, easy. You know, in a different language, you'd have a different uh, acronym, I'm sure. Maybe we could have foam, you know, free. <laughs> the foamy internet, <laughs> free, open, accessible, and multi stakeholders. Um, <laughs> everything comes with a bit of baggage. This is, this is, this is the difficulty of it. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, what became clear to me also was, so who would adopt and who would use this concept the most? And um, it's important that a concept does, uh, however you call it, but it does speak to interests or, 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 or there's a point of entry to people like uh, CEOs, business community, geeks, and so on. Because, I mean, they, you know, they're also affected by all these other components of, of the Internet. But ultimately, this concept 
if it's going to get any traction, I think it needs to get um, endorsement from UNESCO member states. So uh, to what extent is it addressing a problem that we have? And I think our problem is that we don't have a clear holistic view of where our different work on the internet links and, and where it fits in and how we relate to the other dimensions of the internet. And I think this is a framework that does enable us to see the, the, the interdependence of these different uh, dimensions. So uh, we could have called it the open internet, except that other organizations have that uh, concept already. And, and so we need something more distinctive. Now, whether universality is the best concept or not, uh, uh, I, th I think there's, there's arguments for and against that have been made, and I don't want to, to repeat those. Um, I, I think uh, certainly one's open to alternative wording that could capture what we're trying to capture here um, instead of universality. But there is some value in universality that I think has been stated, and it's not intended as an exclusive. The whole thing about this motherhood and apple pie concept is that if, if you say internet universality, people should say it sounds good. They don't quite know what it means. It's like net neutrality. Net neutrality, you know, if you ask even informed people what is net neutrality, you get 100 people and you get 300 responses. But it sounds good. It's only very few people who would say they don't like net neutrality. If you have internet universality, then it may get it could fly in terms of its social, uh, um, at least opening a door to sounds okay, okay, we like, everybody likes universality. Because universality is not exclusivist. It doesn't exclude other things coming into the picture at all. But I think it has got some uh, credibility and some attraction in that sense. Uh, how would we do use this if it um, did become accepted at UNESCO? I think UNESCO, it has some conventions, which is law uh, and rest. But I don't think UNESCO is the kind of place that is going to start coming with conventions on the internet. Even uh, the debate now about privacy and stuff, those who, who are promoting it are not asking for a convention. They're asking for a, a, a statement, a guidelines, charts. They're not asking for law as such. So I think uh, ANREF, UNESCO is not the place where we're going to get your, your, your type of thing. But in terms of getting normative stuff, I think we can uh, get that at UNESCO. And I think it could be useful for in two ways. One is, if it was accepted, maybe we could develop a UNESCO in index is universality increasing or decreasing over time? That would say multi-stakeholderism, is there more or less? Uh, openness, more or less? Rights, more or less? And uh, accessibility, more or less? It would be very interesting to try and say, you know, where are we going? If we would say that these four things are critical to the internet playing its role for, you know, uh, for the world, and uh, in terms of post-2050 development agenda, so the internet necessarily means to that end, how do you measure this universality? That could be pretty interesting, and it could have some policy implications. And then uh, programmatic work, I think it should be useful for us because, um, for example, immediately, if, if, uh, uh, I'm repeating myself here, but this debate around uh, should UNESCO have guidelines on um, or chart or statements about um, privacy and, and the ethics and the internet, immediately, if you have this concept, you say, whatever you're going to come up with that, it can't be done in isolation of these other principles. Because you've got to say, what does ethics and privacy mean in terms of openness, in terms of accessibility, and in terms of multi-stakeholders? So you need to widen the, the debate beyond the, the diplomat who, who feels that it's there and would want to make a thing perhaps, you know, without uh, necessarily understanding the, the whole picture. So it could have programmatic significance and political significance in, in that way. But, uh, well, we passed. We've got a B plus. So I think <laughs> we can do more work to try and uh, get uh, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. something that is, is going to fly more, at least uh, within UNESCO member states. And uh, I, I do appreciate those who are saying that um, you know, it's hard to get agreement. We've had a wonderful panel discussion with very different emphases. And this is a small group. 195 countries. Can you, yeah, can you no, imagine? That, that, is, that is really a preview, preview of what we can expect when this is presented to 195. So, okay. Anna, if you wanted to say uh, something, but we're, we're uh, getting we run, to we the end. Out of time. Just one last I think just. Yeah, 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 you okay. Sorry, sorry, just one last comment. So, well, well we hope that this can continue to evolve and this feedback being very useful. Uh, it may not evolve. The member states may say, no, we don't like this. But next year, the IGF, you can ask us. Okay, well, this through or it didn't fly. And uh, well, we'll carry on doing our work, but 
I have a suggestion, Guy. Yeah. What I think, I think, that I think it's really good that UNESCO is doing that. I absolutely support it. But I think, in a way, you are trying to create something universal when you should actually be creating something for UNESCO. UNESCO deals with education, science, and culture. There's a gap, and there's also a struggle. The internet as a driver and as a platform for education, science, and culture is absolutely pivotal. And there are so many battles. I just, while I was here in, in, in Baku, I had to write a submission um, to South Africa on a draft new intellectual property legislation, which is actually going to threaten open access to educational materials. You know, there are real issues here. There's access to science. There's access to knowledge issues. Um, and I think maybe you can start with this nice banner that you've got, but break it down for UNESCO member states on really the Internet and UNESCO and what type of principles need to be applied in those fields of education, science, and culture. And um, just to, 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 you know, just quickly, I, I, APC was the first organization to use the Universal Declaration of, of, of Human Rights as a basis. And when we did the Internet Rights Charter, Charter in 2001, we interpreted um, from an Internet perspective. We uh, are now just starting to work on the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, trying to come up with a framework for them. Uh, for those rights, and it would be really good to be able to collaborate on you, and we actually have some funding to do a monitoring framework for economic, social, and cultural rights. So I think that would be really important and valuable work for UNESCO to do, and it could then strengthen and add more detail to some of the more generic frameworks we have everywhere else. So thank you, Andrew. I, who was asking? There was one... one. Yep. Please, Parminder. I agree with Enrit uh, Parminder. Uh, Enrit, that it's important to see how inter what Internet means to these areas of UNESCO's work. But I also agree that what Internet means to these areas of work has to be brought to the mainstream as what Internet is. I mean, shouldn't kind of, you know, use all ethical social issues as a kind of a residual area and the mainstream area being uh, what it is. We need to interpret what internet means to people in cultural diversity, education, science, freedom of expression, communication rights areas, and bring it to the main definitions of the internet. In this regard, as for the process going forward, uh, I think it's good, I know UNESCO doesn't have that much funds, but go to the communities uh, which you traditionally engage with, which are education and cultural rights, and uh, uh, freedom of expression, uh, scientific uh, progress, and from those communities get, get the idea of what they see internet from outside in. I think we need a little of an outside in view of internet because this internet community has formed its views and they are strongly represented. And that should help you evolve the universality concept a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? At the risk of getting obsessed about words again, I'm going to go back to some of the earlier points. I, I'm, a, I'm a professor at Georgetown in the communication culture and technology program. I focus on technology, but I've learned a lot about communication. And let me share with you three very quick guidelines. When you're writing a report, always think about what the headline will say. The same applies when you're giving a speech. When Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, he used a completely vague term that meant nothing, no imagery. So the next day it was the Star Wars speech. <laughs> Internet universality, or whatever, is not going to be in a headline. So think of a three or four syllables for your buzzword. Nelson's world of buzzword, you only get three or four syllables for your buzzword, you get seven or eight words for your bumper sticker. Microsoft. <laughs> well, that was, that was the suggestion, actually. My <laughs> last point is that you have to think about your report in terms of how it will be read in 10 years. And maybe Patrick's right. You know, cloud may be blasé by then. Maybe we'll just refer to it as the micro google -thon. <laughs> 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 But think about a term, some new term. Maybe it's net plus, but something that captures more than the Internet. Mm -hmm. Because your, your, your report fo focuses on much more than just the Internet. And, I, and I, so I, I commend you again for a great report, and I again say thank you for letting me be here. 
No, thank, thank you for, for, uh, for all your inputs. I, I think it's very useful. I uh, certainly I don't think that you killed the, the, the concept, uh, but uh, we, we, we got out a bit bruised, <laughs> if I may say. Uh, what, what I re retain is um, maybe uh, two things. One thing is it is a concept for UNESCO first and foremost, and this is what I tried to say at the, at the beginning. We're working first and foremost for ourselves that uh, in every, every time when we engage in debate about internet, use of internet actually, because we, we fit on, on, on this uh, uh, layer which is about use of internet, we don't remind our, our uh, constituency or member states what we're talking about. We're talking about internet which is based on certain principles and that's it. So that is the basis of our conversation. That's the point of departure. If the concept is taken uh, elsewhere, that's even better. But first and foremost, that is, that is concept which is needed for us. Same as knowledge societies, this was presented at the time when everybody was hyped up on information society. Uh, we, we first came and said we're talking about knowledge societies, which is the, already the next concept, how this information is used in order to uh, 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 get, get more knowledge uh, and, how, um, uh, and, yeah, so I would even, even can, uh, cannot say more than that uh, at, the, at the moment. So uh, this concept is exactly the same. We need something uh, to uh, refer to in, in a, in a uh, single way. And secondly, um, we certainly need to refine the wrapping or, or presentation. We need to, to refine argumentation. And maybe we need to think whether uh, we, we need to refer only to 4.4 uh, or add something, something else based on, on, on this conversation. And the title, so if you have any uh, better idea, we're always very <laughs> willing to consider. But the universality, again, it's because of UNESCO is universal, because a uh, universal organization, because uh, internet has global reach. So th this is what we, well, we came, uh, what was the first version of, of the, it was, uh, universality was the second title. Universal Internet. So that was that was the first uh, title, and then we reversed the, 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 the order. Anyway, thank you very much. It it, it was very useful. Uh, we took um, a lot of lot of uh, interest in this conversation. Thank you. And uh, the next iteration certainly we, we will uh, share it with you. Thanks a lot.